Uh, so thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me for this talk. And uh, I would like it to be a very interactive talk. Uh, so you feel free to uh, stop me and ask questions at every stage. And uh, I'll try my best to answer them. Okay. <clears throat> so what are minimal surfaces? That's my topic today. So before coming to minimal surfaces, let's come to the topology of compact oriented surfaces. And they are characterized by what is known as the genus. So what is all this? Okay. So we talk of topology. Many of you might have heard of point set topology. And uh, uh, have you done any topology, any of you? Okay. I won't be at all rigorous in this. But it's like you can deform without tearing or cutting, okay? For example, a ball, surface of a ball, okay? That is topologically equivalent to this kind of a spheroid. So a ball is uh, topologically equivalent to a uh, egg surface, only the surface. I'm talking about surfaces throughout, okay? Not the solid thing inside, okay? So, um, so you might have heard about the sphere, torus, double torus. You may have heard this. So sphere and ellipsoids are abundant in nature. For example, a ball and an egg. They are topologically the same in the sense they are, if you are, if you're making it out of plasticine, you could deform one to the other, right? But however, as you can see, there's this torus, a vara, right? Surface of a vara. That is, there is a hole through it. So you cannot really deform it into this using just plasticine, right? So the surface of the toe, this is a torus. And the surface of a torus is essentially very different from a sphere topologically, okay? And you can talk about double torus, you can talk about triple torus. And in, in the triple torus, you see there are three holes like a pretzel, surface of a pretzel, okay? So how do you make this? Well, you take a sphere and take out some disks from it, okay? And add handles. Do you see what I mean? Supposing you want to make a torus out of a sphere, okay? You take out two disks and add a tube, right? Got it? You just add a tube. So that will give you a torus. If you want a pretzel, you add these uh, two more handles. And you can show that this is equivalent, topologically equivalent to this. Well, you can deform it. You can visualize it, right? You can deform it. Uh, this fat part, you can make it smaller and you can bring it to this. So you would have guessed. So now you can guess that maybe it's this number of... Uh, number of handles you add has something to do with the topology, right? So inequivalent surfaces, ones which you cannot deform from one to the other, they are probably given by this genus. So let's see. And the number of hand handles you add to the sphere is called a genus, okay? So sphere is the genus zero, zero surface. It has no handles attached to it. And it's not topologically equivalent to the torus, which is genus one, and none of them are topologically equivalent to the double torus, which is genus two, and so on. So if you cannot continuously deform one to the other if genuses are different, okay? So now, is there any way, supposing the uh, surface is given to me in a very complicated way, and it's not easy to see how many handles I attach, Okay, but there is a trick. That's the Euler's formula. So you divide the surface into faces. Faces, you can just triangulate the surface. Okay, just divide it up into triangles. And so there'll be a certain number of vertices and edges and the, and the surface inside the triangle, that is the face. Okay, so do you see what I mean? So for example, just a triangle here. Can everyone see this? Just a triangle here. 
has three vertices, three edges, and one face. Okay, we are talking about two dimensional surfaces, right? So, number of vertices, if it is V, number of faces is F, and number of edges is E. And supposing the genus of the surface is G, then the Euler's formula for a compact oriented surface of genus G is V minus E plus F equals to 2 minus 2G. So it is this V minus E plus F, however you subdivide, you can subdivide in many ways, right? However you subdivide, V minus E plus F is a topological invariant 2 minus 2G, okay? That is an amazing formula discovered first by Euler, okay? So let's calculate it. For example, triangulation of the sphere. You can triangulate a sphere like this, this side, is one triangle. These are just geodesic triangles, like, you know, like made out of great circles. I'm not talking about triangles in flat space, right? I'm going to subdivide into triangles like this. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Great circle is a, like, for example, the, uh, I think you call them long longitudes are great circles. So if you have two points on a sphere, how would you construct the great circle passing through them? You look at the center and these two points. So there are three points in R3. You pass a plane through it. It will cut the sphere in a great circle. Okay. For example, the equator is a great circle. The longitudes are great circles. Other than the equator, the latitudes are not great circles. Okay. So great circles are the, you, you, you can visualize it. Okay, the longitudes joining the north and the south pole and the equator. And through any two points, there's a great circle. Okay. So I'm constructing the, supposing I'm constructing the triangles using great circles, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Because by Euler's formula, I'll always get a, I could subdivide it into many smaller triangles, but let's just subdivide into the, this. So one triangle is here, the other triangle is here, this one, and the last one is bottom. Okay. So now what is V? Can someone tell me? One, two, three, four. Four, right? E? Six. Six. F? Three. One, two, three. Four. This one is also a triangle. If you visualize it, the bottom is also a triangle, right? So V is four, E is six, F is four. So eight minus six is two. And two minus two G was this. So G must be equal to zero as confirmed by the Euler's formula, okay? So even if you get a sphere in a very weird way, we'll see. For example, these are all topologically equivalent to the sphere, the platonic solids, okay? This is, this is almost a cube, right? And this is almost a tetrahedron. This is an octahedron. This is a, a dodecahedron and this is an icosahedron. They are actually, you can deform them into a sphere, okay? The surfaces are topologically equivalent to a sphere, okay? So again, you can calculate V minus E plus F. Now it's very easy. Actually, it doesn't matter. You need not triangu triangulate it. Even these blocks here is a face. So here there will be one, two, three. In this face, there'll be one, two, three, four vertices and four edges and one face, okay? This is also a face should not have holes in it. That's the only thing. Okay. You can, I'm, I'm being very rough. I'm not being rigorous at all, but you can get the, so that you can get the flavor. Okay. So these are, so you can divide it into rectangular faces. And again, if you calculate V minus E plus F, what will you get? Two. Okay. Go back home, take a Rubik's cube. Calculate it and see, okay? You should get two. Similarly, there's this tetrahedron. 
now there are the faces are naturally triangles again you do v minus e plus f and octahedron also the faces are uh, triangles dodecahedron faces are pentagons and icosahedron again triangles faces are triangles okay so you calculate them by the way there are nowadays rubik's cube of all these shapes you might have seen right so you if you have them at home just do this small calculation it helps you in uh, right so you would add it would add up v minus e plus f would add up to 2 and that will confirm that the genus is zero okay let's do the torus how do we get the torus the torus can be thought of as a piece of paper with opposite sides identified how can everyone see this side or should i do on both sides we can see okay so you have a piece of paper okay you identify this side with this side you get a cylinder and then you identify this side with this side you get you close up the cylinder got it so basically when you identify just this side with this side you get a cylinder and then when you identify this side with this side you just close up the cylinder so you get a donut shape right okay now how do we calculate so now this is the little piece and i have divided it into triangles so now we shouldn't over count right this 1 3 is the same as 1 3 here 3 1 is the same as 3 1 here and 1 2 is is the same as 1 2 here and 2 1 is here and 4 is uh, nothing is identified in the middle right the middle thing is untouched only the boundaries are identified got it right so so now let's calculate maybe i'll leave it as an exercise you can calculate it at home just don't over count so when you are counting 1 3 don't count 1 3 here also just count it once okay So there's how many edges? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve edges in this. Okay, just calculate once. One, don't count this. One three three one, one two two one, then one four. Two three four one three two, and then two four four two three four and four three. These are all edges. You have to count them as separate edges, right? And what he says also, the these four points will be identified to one. Okay, got it. When you close up the figure, so basically, what point is that? so what you are doing is you are taking the torus okay this is the side which i have drawn with one arrow and uh, sorry this is the circle which i have drawn with one arrow this is the circle which i have drawn with so if you cut along these two circles you will get that square okay and this is the point one okay so i'll please do this exercise at home okay v minus e plus f equals to zero any triangle or any connected closed planar figure v minus e plus f equals to 1 because supposing you take a triangle number of edges and number of vertices is the same number of faces is 1 so that is 1 okay now what about examples of non oriented surfaces this is a mobius strip okay mobius strip you know you take a uh, band of paper twist it and glue it that's a mobius band okay this has boundary but you can show that it has only one s1 boundary okay the boundary is a circle okay now that was all about topology now when we talk about geometry we talk of lengths of curves on surfaces area of surface gaussian curvature mean curvature etc in this sense the sphere and ellipsoids though they are topologically equivalent they are very different 
sphere, for example, is totally symmetric, while the ellipsoid is not. Right. So you can see that already geometry tells you distinguishes between the sphere and the ellipsoid, which were to topologically the same. Okay. So now we will come to uh, geometry. This entire talk is about geometry. Okay. So now it's going to get a little bit technical. So please feel free to stop me. Okay. So now, supposing you have, so if I write on this side, will you be able to see it or I write a little further? Okay. okay. A surface is in R3. All of you know what is R3? Right. Okay. So now a surface is in R3. So this is X, Y, and Z. Okay. So for example, you know the equation part of a sphere, for example. So Z is equal to square root of one minus X squared plus Y squared. This is, for example, the upper half part of the sphere. Okay. So what you notice is Z can be written as function of X and Y locally, not globally. On the whole sphere cannot be described by this way. To describe the whole sphere, you need to go to the, describe the bottom hemisphere, side hemisphere, everything. But just the upper hemisphere can be written as square root of one minus X squared plus Y squared. Okay. So notice that Z has been written as function of x and y. So there are two independent parameters now. And the third parameter is determined because actually you have only two degrees of freedom on the surface. So you can call it degrees of freedom, right? You can only, even though it's a something in, so the point here is actually x, y, z of x, y. So actually the two independent parameters here are X and Y and Z is determined. Okay, so, so basically I'll be talking about such surfaces, but so they'll be given by either they'll, so uh, U, V, Z of U, V, these are called graphical, graphically represented surfaces. So UV are two independent parameters. Z is determined from U and V, okay? Or one thing we can do is, we can set two independent parameters, two degrees of freedom, and write X as a function of UV, Y as a function of UV, and Z as a function of UV. So all three are implicit functions of U and V. This is a more general way of writing, okay? This is a more general way of writing. So X is a function of UV, Y is a function of UV, Z. So these are called parameterized surfaces in R3. Any questions? Yes. This one is a graphical representation. If I can write it as U comma V, Z of UV. So either this or say U comma y of u v v this is also a graphical representation so also another way of writing a graphical representation is x of u v u comma v okay one of the x coordinates is written in terms of the other two okay one of the coordinates x y or z is written in terms of other two. That is a graphical representation. But a more democratic representation is X of UV, Y of UV, Z of UV. Implicitly, all three of them depend on two parameters. This is a more general representation, okay? Sometimes you are able to write it as a graphical representation, either this, this, or this. Uh, let me see if I have written it correctly, yeah. But, the most general representation is X is a function of UV, Y is a function of UV, and Z is a function of UV. And UV are some parameters which will come from the problem you want to tackle. Okay. 
comes from the problem you want to tackle. Okay. So x of uv. So when I write the bold x, bold x in this means small x of uv, y of uv, z of uv. Okay. Any questions so far? Stop me because this is a little tricky. Okay. And you cannot always find global parameters. Okay. This is again the uv is a local parameter parameterization. Okay. Uv cannot. For example, UV cannot run over the entire R2 most of the time. Yeah? Once again? We'll come to that. For minimal surfaces, for example, you see that if UV runs over the entire XY plane, then the only minimal surface is the plane itself, different kinds of planes. Okay, so anyway, we'll come to that. So that's called the Bernstein theorem. I I won't touch upon that very much, but okay. So X of UV, Y of UV, Z of UV locally. Okay. For example, the helicoid Z is, Z is equal to tan inverse Y by X. This is called the helicoid and it looks like this. You go once round X. So tan inverse Y by X, can someone recognize this? Tan inverse Y by X? Theta. Exactly, it's an angle as you go right round. Okay, Z is tan inverse Y by X. So UV tan inverse V by U, you can write Y as V, X as U. So th this is tan inverse V by U. This is a graphical parameter. Again, it's valid only locally. Or you can parameterize it by R comma theta, R cosine theta, R sine theta and theta. So this you can see already, this is a very good parameterization because you can see you fix an R, small little uh, circle, you go right round, the surface has climbed two pi distance, right? Z is equal to theta. So it's climbing, right? And as soon as you go once round, the surface has already climbed two pi distance. That is a helicoid, okay? Okay, now there is a very novel parameter, parameterization. Have any of you seen complex numbers? All of you have seen complex numbers, right? So now I'm going to combine U and V into U plus IV. Okay, the UV quad, the, which was running on R2, uh, a domain in R2, right? I'm going to complexify it, U plus IV. Zeta is equal to U plus IV. And x of u comma v, I'm going to write in terms of zeta and zeta bar. Okay, x of zeta zeta bar, y of zeta zeta bar, z of zeta zeta bar. For example, x of zeta zeta bar is minus half imaginary part of zeta plus one over zeta. Real and imaginary, all of you know? Okay, so zeta plus one over zeta is a complex number. And I take its imaginary part minus half. Okay, real part of zeta minus one over zeta, uh, z zeta zeta bar is minus pi by two imaginary part of ln zeta. Okay, this again, this very novel parameterization is valid because it's a minimal surface. Okay, so we'll come to this. Okay, but before that, I wanted to show you some explicit examples of minimal surfaces. And then we'll come to, uh, uh, so, how many of you have taken differential geometry, uh, mean curvature, Gaussian curvature, and all those things? You have not yet done that. So I'll skip that part. Maybe at the end, I'll come back to it. You just now just assume that so we'll be talking about surfaces called minimal surfaces, which appear in nature as idealized soap films. Okay, they are, why are they called minimal? Because given a curve, supposing you have a curve, you dip it in soap solution, you will find these films, soap films, and they minimize the area locally. Locally means I, I dip it many times, I may get different, different minimal surfaces. If you dip it many times, 
you try this experiment. You have a little wireframe, you dip it in soap solution. Every time you may get a different one, okay? Depending on how the wire is shaped, okay? So, and these are minimal because uh, they are stationary points of an area functional, okay? I'll just talk about that later. So, these are soap films spanning a wireframe. This is a catenoidal soap film. So you take two rings and dip it in soap solution. You will get a catenoidal. You, you may get various types of catenoids. It's not that you will get only one catenoid. But like I, as I said, this curve, as you can see, these three minimal surfaces are different. But the point is, if you part up them slightly, supposing you have one of them, you part up it slightly, the surface you get will have area larger than this one. It may be that if you part up it a lot, there may be another minimal surface which has much less area. That may be possible. But if you part up it slightly, of all the part up surfaces slightly, this one is the minimal area. Okay, that's why it's called a minimal surface. Okay. And if anybody knows about mean curvature, the uh, mean curvature zero surface, they have the property that the mean curvature is uh, zero at every point. So every point is like a saddle, okay? But caution, soap bubbles are not minimal surfaces since they have non-zero mean curvature at every point. Okay, soap bubbles are not minimal surfaces. They have a completely different geometry. They are called constant mean curvature surfaces. And that is a very beautiful topic by itself. If you type in CMC surfaces in uh, Google, you will see them. Like many surfaces in, many uh, objects in nature actually can be described by CMC surfaces. So soap bubbles are different. So let's see. There is the helicoid and the catenoid. The catenoid was part of the catenoid was this one, catenoidal soap film, right? And these are conjugate minimal surfaces. I'll explain that. This is the NAPR surface, potato chips, okay? And this is another type of NAPR surface. This one self intersects, as you can see. This one will also ultimately self intersect, but yeah, so these are shark surfaces. By the way, when I draw it like this, you have to imagine that they're extended in every direction, okay? I'm not, I'm just cutting a little piece and showing. Here also is another kind of shark surface, okay? This is the Costa surface. This is a beautiful surface. It has a lot of number theory in it. Okay, and, uh, uh, and the reason is it's immersion of a torus with three punctures. So basically this is a torus, genus one, and you, you puncture it in three places and immerse it in R3 as a minimal surface and the punctures become ends like this. The three ends, they open up, the punctures just open up in like this. And so it's a, there's a genus, you can't see the genus very well and the surface self intersects. Okay, so this is the Costa surface. This is the Riemann staircase. This is the multiple genus helicoid. So this one, as you can see has multiple genus. This one has one, uh, yeah, this one is also a multiple genus. Every black, this thing will have a genus, okay? But what you notice is you can't get a torus as a minimal surface, right? You never saw a torus. You saw a torus with three punctures, but you never saw a torus. The reason is, we'll come to that. And this is a triply, minimal, triply periodic minimal surface, which you see in crystallography and on, okay? So there are molecules here. This is called an equipotential surface, okay? So you see minimal surfaces in nature a lot, okay? 
Okay, now what is the Plato's problem for a layman, layperson? So, given a small closed wire frame, if you dip it in soap solution, is there any soap film spanning it? And if so, how many? So, Jesse Douglas and many other mathematicians gave the answer to the mathematical formulation of this question in the affirmative. And subsequently, this has been a field of active research. The question of how many minimal surfaces span a given curve has been studied by Tromba using bifurcation theory. So as you see, you have a Mobius curve. So you have a curve, you have twisted it. And so you had this, you twisted it and glued it, right? And you dip it in soap solution. You see there is this type and this type. You can see, at least visually, it is clear that these two types are different, right? So already you see that, okay. Now, I won't go into all the mathematical details, but one thing, supposing locally the minimal surface can be written as graph of a function, okay. Supposing in a little part, you can write it as x, y, z is equal to phi of x phi. Okay. For example, we saw x y tan inverse y by x was the helicoid. Right. Okay. Now what equation does this, I told you that there's a geometry to it, the mean curvature has to be zero at every point. So what is that equation? The equation is very complicated nonlinear equation. So one plus phi x, you know this notation, right? Phi x is the partial derivative with respect to x and so on. So one plus phi x squared phi y y minus two phi x phi y phi x y plus one plus phi y squared phi x x equals to zero. A heavily nonlinear equation, right? So, but in certain parameter, as I said, x y phi of x y wasn't a very, democratic way of writing it. Actually better way, if we can find a very clever way of writing it as x of uv, y of uv, z of uv, right? And yes, there are, oh, sorry, this is a spell, spelling mistake. There are special conformal parameters. So there are some special parameters known as conformal parameters. And in that parameter, this equation, this very complicated equation just becomes harmonicity of the coordinates. What does harmonicity of coordinates mean? I'm sorry, that side, you can't see much. You can see, okay. So I have written it as X of UV, Y of UV, Z of UV, right? So harmonicity of the coordinates means you take the X, X coordinate, That's one equation. Second equation is y u u plus y v v equals to zero. And the third equation is z u u plus z v v equals to zero. So now you can ask what about nonlinearity? This is, these are three linear equations, right? So the nonlinearity is in this choice of the, choice of the, uh, conformal parameters, U and V. U and V is particular to every minimal surface. You cannot say, oh, I can find a par conformal parameter which works for all minimal surfaces. That's not true, okay? Each particular minimal, each actually, there are some families which may have UV common, but in general, if you have, if you arbitrarily pick two minimal surfaces, their conformal parameters are not the same, okay? So this is where the harmonic uh, the nonlinearity is hidden. Okay. So now the nice thing about harmonicity of coordinates is the the harmonic functions are real and uh, I mean uh, the real and imaginary part of holomorphic functions are harmonic. What are holomorphic functions? Does anybody know? Okay. Let me explain. Okay, so 
supposing you have a function of u v which satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations. Okay, what are the Cauchy Riemann's equation? If u equals to g v and if v equals to minus g u. Okay, then if you write z as u plus i v, then these two equations we will mean a very beautiful thing. It will mean, and supposing z bar is u minus i v, these two equations you can work it out will mean f plus i g. This function, which is a function of u and v, can be written as capital F of zeta only. So, uh, sorry, z. Z. Okay, so let me call it zeta because z I was using as the third coordinate. Let me call it zeta, zeta bar. Okay, so this will only depend on, so in general, it will depend on zeta and zeta bar, right? Because it depends on u and v. But if these equations are satisfied, it only depends on zeta and not zeta bar. That's the beautiful part. And also, these two equations will also mean that f and g are harmonic. These are exercises, yes? Harmonic is this, like supposing you have a function f, which is harmonic, the function of, it's a function of two variables, real valued function of two variables, and f of u, u, plus f of v, v equals to zero. Oh, that is, uh, I won't be able to tell you offhand, but uh, for example, a linear uh, uh, affine plane is a harmonic function. A, a u plus b v equals to a constant, this kind of a function. Supposing you take a u plus b v, f of u comma v is a u plus b v plus c. Okay. Harmonic function must satisfy f u u plus f v v equals to zero. This is a very strong condition. Yeah, this is the Laplacian. Laplacian of f is zero. There is a lot of, we can talk about it afterwards. It's very important, harmonic functions. And for me, it is important because the real and the imaginary part of holomorphic functions are harmonic. Okay. So functions which only depend on zeta and not zeta bar, I'm calling them holomorphic, right? And it has real and imaginary parts. The, each of the parts are harmonic. The real part and the imaginary part individually are functions of u and v, and they are harmonic. Okay, this is the beauty. Okay, and it therefore, and you have harmonicity of coordinates, each of x, y, and z are harmonic now. Okay, so that means you will be able to uh, relate them to real and imaginary parts of holomorphic functions. Okay, so, and there's another beautiful fact which follows from harmonicity, complete minimal surfaces cannot be compact. So there is a reason why the torus never appeared, punctured torus appeared, but the torus never appeared as a minimal surface, okay? So this part is little technical, but I'll still tell, try to tell you the flavor of it, okay? So zeta is U plus IV, Okay, and zeta bar is u minus iv. Then you can take your, so I want to write it as x of uv, I want to write it as x of zeta zeta bar, right? x of zeta zeta bar, y of zeta zeta bar, phi of zeta zeta bar, where zeta is running in a domain, say a simply connected domain. Let's just take it to be running in a disk. Okay, then there is a holomorphic function f, and a meromorphic function G, meromorphic 
forget about what that means it's a technical term okay right now just forget about that so such that fg squared is holomorphic okay holomorphic was those functions which only depended on zeta and not zeta bar roughly okay so and meromorphic is it can have some poles it can have some singularities like one over zeta is a meromorphic function because you are dividing by zeta right one over zeta minus 3 for example is a meromorphic function anyway never mind we'll talk about that after class so holomorphic function f and meromorphic function g such that fg squared is holomorphic such that the minimal surface can be written like this why am I showing you all this? Because it is a most general solution to that equation, that nonlinear equation. Why? Why is x, y, phi can be written like this? Uh, so you take your favorite f and your favorite g such that f is holomorphic and g is meromorphic and fg squared is holomorphic. Then you can construct this, write this up, okay? and it will give you a minimal surface. So this is the most general solution locally you can have of a minimal surface. You pick up any F and G of your choice, which has to satisfy these mild conditions. Okay. And each of F and G have some geometric interpretation also. Okay, I won't talk about that. And you can rewrite that equation like this. I won't get into the technicalities in a neighborhood of a non-umbilical non point where the Gaussian curvature is non-zero. Any minimal surface can be represented in terms of a non-vanishing meromorphic function RW. Okay. So that means you take a non-vanishing meromorphic function RW. I'll show you some examples. And you write this equation, these three equations. And as you see, these are actually uh, integral zeta 0 to zeta 1 minus w squared rw dw, this is a holomorphic function of zeta. You take its real part, x0 plus, x0 is a constant, x of zeta zeta bar is this, y of zeta zeta bar is this, z of zeta zeta bar is this, okay? Then you get a minimal surface. For example, your choice of r could be 1. If you take r to be 1 in this, you get that potato chips, okay? So all you have to do is take R is equal to one and you get the potato chips. This, if you take R is K by two W squared K real, it corresponds to the catenoid. If you take R is equal to one by K two W squared, it corresponds to the helicoid. Then there is the general helicoid, we'll see this. Then the shark's minimal surface, the one with the brown tunnels, which I had shown you, this one corresponds to that. And the one which was red, reddish shark surface, this one corresponded to this. Okay. And then there are other minimal surfaces you can construct leading to Henneberg's minimal surface, Catalan's surface, and so on. Okay. All right. So this was the shark's, okay, now I'll just briefly tell you a little bit of magic. So this is the shark's first surface. This is, sorry, this is called the shark's first surface. This is the second surface, okay. This one corresponded to R is equal to uh, this quantity. This object corresponded to the red one and this one corresponded to the other one this one tunnel okay so now okay if you perform the integrals this is how they look i'm not looking into that and okay i won't get into much of harmonic conjugate uh, uh, but there is a family of minimal surfaces connecting the helicoid to the catenoid as you can see each part the topology is changing okay but they are isometric in the sense that uh, two given points here go to two given points, the lengths between them won't change and so on. Okay. So they are isometric deformation of the helicoid to the catenoid. And at each stage, there is a minimal surface. Okay. 
this was not self self intersecting this was not but in between intermediate ones can self intersect okay now i wanted to show you some magic this is Ra of course ramanujan's euler ramanujan i shouldn't say only ramanujan euler also knew about this tan inverse tan h y cot x is equal to summation k goes from minus infinity to infinity tan inverse y by x plus k by okay so this is this is by the way available in your uh, in ramanujan's notebook okay this formula and summation k goes from minus infinity to infinity okay now this z is equal to tan inverse tan h y cot x this is the shark's first surface the red one okay and tan inverse y by x you know what is it tan inverse y by x you have seen z is equal to tan inverse y by x the helicoid right that was the helicoid and all you did was to shift the helicoid by k pi k pi is a just a constant okay so you are taking infinite sum of minimal surfaces height functions of minimal surfaces height function is the z okay the z coordinate is the height right so the height functions function of x and y so tan inverse y by x you put the put the helicoids in an array sum up the height functions and you get uh, the height function of a uh, shucks first surface z is equal to tan inverse tan h y cot x is a shucks first surface which is surprising because remember the height function satisfied a highly non linear equation that 1 plus phi x squared phi y y and so on right so, but there's an infinite sum, of course. So, tan inverse tan h y cot x is summation this, okay. So, this was used in, this was, I don't know whether it was discovered by them, but uh, condensed matter physics, this is very useful, okay. It, these helicoids correspond to screw dislocations, and these are liquid crystals, you see surfaces like this, okay. So we also use them and there it's also possible to do finite decompositions. This was an infinite decomposition, but Z of X, Y is equal to LN cosine by cosine, by cosine X. So this can be decomposed into scaled versions. Actually this minimal surface equation, though it looks very complicated and all, if you scale X and Y and Z by the same quantity, it is again a minimal surface, okay? And if you shift X by uh, a constant, again, it's a minimal surface, okay? So these are almost minimal surfaces. Uh, there has to be a one over N Z. So in general, these are scaled and displaced versions of minimal surfaces. If you sum them up, you get back your second surface, okay? So again, this can be, uh, this can be uh, proved by using an Euler Ramanujan identity like this cos x plus a by cosine a is k uh, uh, product of k goes from 1 to infinity this quantity. Okay, so ln on both sides, this is a convergence series, and using that, you can prove these. Okay, and again, this will have applications in liquid crystals. Okay, and uh, so any questions? Because I think I have come to the, oh. Okay, there are various other kind of problems. For example, if you take two, mini, two curves, real analytic curves, is there a minimal surface joining them? This kind of questions. The answer is yeah, if they're close enough. They're very far, you won't get a, you'll get two disconnected minimal surfaces. But if you want to interpolate, then, and me and my collaborators, this was, this follows from Douglas's work, but we used inverse function theorem, okay? So, and there are various other problems you can think of. Uh, there is a lot of connection with number theory and other areas of mathematics. Minimal surface is very rich because it's 200 or 300 years old subject. Lot of uh, research has gone into it. Okay. 
So this talk is partly based on Docarmo's book on differential geometry of curves and surfaces. I didn't do that part very much because it was technical. Osserman's book on survey of minimal surfaces, DRK's Hildebrand Kuster Wolra book on minimal surfaces, Nietzsche's book. So these books have a lot of pictures and theory. If you ever want to get into minimal surfaces, these are the things to talk about. This, I don't know why I put it in this slide, but this also connects this linear and nonlinear waves. This book will enable you to connect it to other kinds of surfaces like born in felt solitons and solitonic surfaces and so on. Okay. Then Ramanujan's notebooks. Okay, then sorry. I then there are various papers of mine with my collaborators. Okay. So the, my papers are all available in the archive. So, uh, so if you want to get into minimal surfaces and now there are the maximal surfaces in Lorentz Minkowski space. Those are beautiful, even more beautiful because they have singularities. Okay, beautiful swallowtail singularities and all. So um, they, for that you need to know differential geometry of curves and surfaces in Lorentz Minkowski space. Okay. So when the metric is has a in uh, negative is not positive definite. Okay, then there we can still talk of main curvature zero surfaces and so on. All right. So if you have any questions, that's all I wanted to say. Singularity. Okay, so for this, uh, this minimal surfaces do not have singularities in the sense I'm talking. Okay, but for maximal surfaces, for example, if you have a cone, two cones, uh, you know, you have heard about the light cone and all. Double huh? A double yeah, double cone. So that will have a conical singularity in the uh, middle. Okay, so. Um, by singularity, singularity has a very complicated definition in maximal surfaces, but uh, you can say that, um, you know, in, in Lorentz Minkowski space, what happens is you can have vectors whose norms are zero, but they are themselves non zero. Okay, so singularity comes from there, like. Mm, without going into technicalities, I can't really uh, give you a definition. But uh, for example, you, you saw the, um, for example, in the, uh, there are in maximal surfaces in Lorentz Minkowski space, you can have surfaces like this. They are not exactly cone. These are not maximal surfaces, but there are, you know, there are points where the tangent space can have a light like vector. I can't really explain it to you without going into technicalities. Okay. So, uh, but uh, I can give you, so first thing to read is Lopez's book. There are beautiful, um, uh, beautiful papers on maximal surfaces. And I think now there are books also written on those. Okay, so surfaces with singularities uh, and maximal surfaces can have various kinds of singularities and it goes into the area of integrable systems. So it is very deep. In fact, minimal surfaces also go into the area of integ so-called integrable systems, okay. So this is an example of a integrable systems because you know you could solve a very highly nonlinear equation using this Weistrass and Epper representation. So in a sense, the equation can be solved. So similarly for maximal surfaces uh, and uh, uh, 
there are these, uh, but maximal surface differences, there could be singularities. And those are various types, like they have not yet classified. So if anybody is interested in this subject, I can give you a lot of papers on it. And uh, uh, there are the swallowtail, cuspoidal, then front-like singularities. It goes very much into the area of integrable system. So I will, uh, I will give you if you, anybody is interested. But it is a little bit advanced. It's a research topic. You have to first read a lot about Lawrence Minkowski space. The intuition is very different because there could be non-zero vectors whose norm is zero. Their, the vector itself is non-zero, but its norm is zero. Okay, so the, this is the this is the kind of intuition we have to understand. But minimal surfaces are in Euclidean space. Lengths are as we know. Vectors have length. This is the length of the vector. If it, this is a vector, this is the length of the vector. It's just usual. Everything is usual. Okay. All right. Any other questions? <laughs>